church. Thank you for singing out. If you're able to remain standing, I invite you to do so. Please take your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, please. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. If you don't have a Bible, we have pew Bibles. You are more than welcome to make use of those. That is why they are there. But I'd love for you to follow along in the text that I'll read uh, out loud and you can follow along. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 5. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 5. It says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we were despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us, yet also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity... Not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. We have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you word. For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. As also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus." And I'd like to speak to you on this subject, pillars of joy, pillars of joy. Let's pray. Lord, thank you very much again for the safety you've given us, the wherewithal to get here, to assemble together. Lord, I think something special happens when the body of Christ assembles together. Lord, I do pray that in every aspect of the service, whether it's upstairs in our sound booth and the nursery and the junior church, you would get all honor and glory that you rightfully deserve. Holy Spirit of God, we need to hear from heaven today. We need a touch from glory today. I pray that you'd please use me as just a tool in your mighty hand. Lord, please give me the words to say. God, please don't let me say anything that should not be said. Holy Spirit of God, do a work in our midst, please, in our own hearts, but also corporately. And Lord, would you help us to hold on to these pillars of joy, to understand the importance, not just for testimony, but for our very health, to choose to rejoice in spite of the difficult times. Lord, please bless now the preaching of your word. Bless now the service. Walk amongst us and help us. We'll give you all the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. If you are able to sit upstairs in Sunday school, this kind of goes hand in hand with the Sunday school lesson. I've never met anyone who doesn't desire real joy. Perhaps they go about it a little differently. Perhaps they have different uh, understandings or thoughts about how to attain it. But at the end of the day, I truly believe everyone here, not just here but everywhere, wants to be joyful. They want to find joy in their life. If you study joy, it's mentioned over 150 times in Scripture. And joy is defined as deep gladness, exuberance, worthy of glory, and delight. And we've talked about the difference between a deep abiding joy versus circumstantial happiness. And I wrote it this way, while happiness is the pendulum of a clock coming and going back and forth to and fro, joy is the clock itself, always abiding, always clicking, always reliable. And if you've heard me preach any length of time, you know that I'm going to tell you that joy is a byproduct of knowing and walking with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the bringer of joy, and friend, you simply cannot be joyful without the Lord Jesus. All right, we got to get on the same page now. If not, it's going to be a long sermon, trust me. You cannot have a deep abiding joy without Jesus Christ. 
right? Who has awakened your soul, stirred you up, and, and uh, saved you from your sin, and guarantees you a home in heaven. You can find happiness. You can find temporary enjoyment, pleasure, sure. But joy, that deep abiding joy, it is a fruit of the Spirit, therefore it is incapable of manifesting itself in your life without the Holy Spirit of God, which happens when you trust Jesus as Savior. Therefore, you cannot have joy unless you have Jesus. <clears throat> John 16, 23 and 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Anyone who says Jesus does not desire his people to have a full joy, they don't know their Bible, they don't know their scripture, and they don't walk with the Lord. Joy is a byproduct of Jesus, and of course he desires that his people, the born-again Christians, show joy, a deep abiding joy to the world. Now, understand this, that anyone can be joyful in the good times. It's in the difficult times that when you choose joy, that testimony really makes a difference. All right, And I think we all understand that. It's easy to you know, praise the Lord and find joy when everything's going well. But in the storms of life, when you choose to rejoice, that's when people really start to notice and pay attention. As the disciples worship Jesus, as he ascends into heaven, joy follows. It says this in Luke 24, verse 51 and 52. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Anywhere Jesus went, joy was sure to follow him. And anyone here today who is saved knows that the Lord Jesus, as their personal Savior, gives them all the ingredients to be joyful. If you have Jesus, you can have joy. Okay? If you don't hear anything else, if you have Jesus, you can have joy. So throughout your scripture, as I mentioned, there's a lot of places you find joy, a lot of uh, scriptures regarding rejoicing, choosing to rejoice, and understanding what joy is and things like that. Before any of that matters, you do must understand, or you need to understand, Jesus is the absolute must for joy. Jesus is the foundation. Okay, friend, if you're here and you're not saved, you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, you simply cannot have joy. Okay, you can be happy. You can, you can be pleased with the way things are going in life, but a deep abiding joy you will never enjoy. You will never understand until you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, built that relationship with Him. So once Jesus is there, once we are saved, we can build upon that foundation, right? Jesus is the solid rock, right? We can build upon that foundation and we can erect pillars of joy. Now, I am the type that if I'm going to like build a tree house or something, you want to shore up the foundation as sure as possible, right? Because you don't want it to go falling down. Well, Jesus is the foundation, sure, which is un unpenetrable, unbreakable. Praise God for that. But as we build the walls and as we build the pillars and as we try to grow from this foundation of joy, we need to understand how to exactly build those things. There's no one here who says, preacher, I don't want to be joyful. Every single one of you want joy, right? You want to feel joyful, especially in this day and age. I mean, you want to be discouraged, look outside. Goodness gracious, the mud, the cold, the snow. I mean, this is the slush. Snow is pretty. That's slush. That's sick, right? That's going to make anyone sad. No, unless you're going mudding or something, then of course that's great. But it's cold, and it's gray, and it's wet. Is anyone sad yet? All right, let me keep going. We all desire joy, and let's just be real, it's hard to get this time of year. It just is, okay? If you found the secret, that's incredible. A lot of people struggle with joy this time of year. So what I'd like to do is from our text, okay, from this particular text, I'm going to give you some pillars of joy. And no, Brother Brian Fox, these aren't the things you lay on your head to sleep. Those are different pillars, all right? He says, hallelujah, like hallelujah, you know, so I kind of like it. I, I better move on. But anyway, that's how, that's how he says pillar. Where, who took my pillar, you know, and it's like, <laughs> right? I mean, so I'm not talking about pillars as in something you lay your head on, okay? I'm and pray for him. He's going to be gone for the next three weeks and church is presenting help missions. So you make sure you add him to your prayer list. I'm talking about pillars. I'm talking about those things that you can build upon and build from and ensure that whatever project you're, you're working on, which in this case would be being joyful, can continue throughout the storms of life. Look what I see in verse, let's start in verse 12. And again, there's a lot of pillars of joy. I'm just trying to take it from this text here. First thing I see is that joy is found in a clear conscience. You see that there in verse 12. Joy is found in a clear conscience. 
I talked about this in Sunday school, and this will feel a bit like a Bible study, but I believe it'll benefit you. The Apostle Peter gives a glimpse of the value of a pure, clear conscience unto the Lord in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. He says, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your, uh, for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Now, what he's saying here is that even when you are going through the trials and the troubles of life, having a pure conscience for the Lord unto the Lord lets you know that you can thank God and rejoice in these circumstances. What does that mean? That means if you go through a trial, we talked about this a little bit Wednesday night, you go through a trial, a lot of times we think of, did I do something wrong? right? Is this a punishment? Is this a chastisement? Why is this happening to me? And immediately, and I'll talk about guilt later on to the end of the message, immediately we start to feel guilty of things perhaps we've done. Maybe I didn't do something I was supposed to do, or I did something I wasn't supposed to do. And we start to think like, is this a, is this a spanking, right? Is this discipline from the Lord? But if you have a clear conscience, pure in the eyes of God, saying, Lord, uh, total, complete sincerity and honesty between me and you, I can't think of anything between us. There is no idolatry. There's no sin that I can think of. I don't believe there's anything that needs confess. And if that's the case, then I can have that clear conscience and I can have that joy that what God has allowed is for a perfect purpose. This isn't a chastisement. It's sitting to get my attention. Again, I'm not going to re-preach what I talked about in Sunday school, but it's setting the stage for God to get some glory in some way, shape, or form. This trial you are going through, it's setting the, the, the platform to let God and Jesus be magnified to others. And as you have that clear conscience, understanding that, okay, this is not a chastisement. Lord, as far as I know, I've confessed sin. There's nothing going on between us. I can rejoice understanding that what you are allowing in my life at this point in time is leading to something bigger. It's going to be a way that you show yourself to others. You're going to get glory in this. That's what Paul prayed in Philippians 1. He said, something good is coming from this. That type of approach, guys, only comes with a clear conscience. There's nothing between me and the Lord. There's nothing between me and others, right? I'm not looking behind my shoulder because I know I did something wrong. One of my favorite videos you see on YouTube is Guilty Dogs. You ever Googled Guilty Dogs? They're so funny. My wife and I, we laugh all the time. Google Guilty Dogs. When dogs tore up a pillow and the, the owner will be like, now who did this? And that dog's like, there's no joy in that dog's life, right? Normally, dogs are happy and panting, happy to see you, but if they come home, the owners come home, and the pillow has been shredded, and they said, who did this? That dog can't hide it. I mean, he's like, and his eyes are shifting, and he doesn't even want to look. That's because his conscience is not clear. So what I'm saying, guys, is if you want joy, i got to ask you, how clear is your conscience? How pure are you living? How sincere are you living in the eyes of God? You should live in such a way that there's zero offense or animosity between you, between the Lord, between anybody else. I understand that we have this sinful nature, this old flesh. I get that. But friend, as we grow, there ought to be something in us that wants to forsake the old ways and put on the new man and strive to live for Christ in every way, and that includes our thoughts. Acts twenty four sixteen. and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. What Paul is saying right there is it takes effort to be this way. It takes effort. It takes uh, a zeal and an energy. I have to purposely decide, I want to live a clear conscience between God and men. And he even admonishes Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.5, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. The point I'm trying to make is, if you do not have a clear conscience, if there's something weighing on you, it is a guilty conscience, knowing you're not right with God, knowing you're not right with others, it's going to be very hard to be joyful. You can pretend like it doesn't bother you. You can pretend to be happy, but deep down you're like, I just can't grab that joy because I know there's something wrong in me that needs to get right. You want to build your joy? You've got to have a clear conscience. That's what Paul said in verse 12. Number two, it's in the same thing, verse 12. Joy is found in simplicity. Joy is found in simplicity. 
When you and I make too much of a situation, we try to overthink things, overcomplicate things, it stresses us out. Does anyone want to give me a witness right there? Can I get an amen? When you overthink, when you overcomplicate, it just makes the situation more stressful. It creates friction. It creates anxiety. It can even lead to anger. It can lead to being frantic. That type of lifestyle does not sound very joyful to me. But sometimes we are our own worst enemy, aren't we? In just a few chapters over, Paul would warn people about overcomplicating Jesus. His salvation, it's easy. And yet a lot of people make it far more difficult than it needs to be. 2 Corinthians 11.3, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, throughout Scripture, if you study, we are warned about a type of simplicity, that, and that type of simplicity is defined as simple-mindedness or foolishness, right? You've heard the phrase, well, ignorance is bliss. That's not what the Scripture teaches, all right? That's not what the Scripture's saying here. Verse 12 of our text is saying that Paul found joy in keeping matters simple. Got a problem? Solve it. Move on. We don't have to broadcast it. Don't have to stir it up. Don't have to fret and stress and lose sleep about it. Just take care of it. Just take care of the problem. It's joy is found in simplicity, handling things just simply and not making it so complicated. Church, I got to ask you, are you guilty of overcomplicating things? Are you guilty of thinking yourself nuts? Right? Is that an oxymoron? <laughs> an oxymoron talking about an oxymoron? You ever think about something so much it just engulfs you, it just completely consumes you? You're like, ah, now I can't enjoy this dinner. I've done that. I, I wish I hadn't. I can't tell you how many times just, you know, family dinners or going out to eat or doing something, I have something on my mind is just so corrupted, has warped me so much to the point, I can't enjoy supper with family. I can't enjoy watching the ball game. I can't enjoy little things because I'm just, my mind is wrapped around something. What I'm trying to tell you, joy is found in simplicity. I'm not talking about making light of things that you really have to deal with. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about stop overcomplicating things. Stop making mountain out of molehills. Why would you choose to live that way? Are you familiar with the KISS method? I won't say anything else if you are. <laughs> Don't want to be too mean from the pulpit. How about this? Keep it simple, silly. KISS, does that work? Keep it simple, silly. That last S is up for interpretation. As many of you are laughing about, you understand. I understand that issues need to be resolved. I get it. Problems got to be discussed, talked about, decided upon, taken care of. But friend, we're only making matters harder when we decide to make it more complicated, right? When we decide that we can't leave it with the Lord because we're so consumed by it and it just builds and builds and builds and it just stresses us out. Joy comes when we keep it simple. I'm not talking about keeping it ignorant. I'm not talking about being unlearned. I'm talking about keeping it simple. Let's be careful not to be argumentative, pushing back, fault finding. Keep it simple. Keeping the not-so-important matters simple, finding solutions, that will build joy upon your life. You guys cannot deny the natural encouragement and upliftment that comes when you solve a problem, right? When you got a problem, even something like, well, this extension cord ain't going to reach. I wonder if I went under this way, went around, maybe got two extensions, and you figure it out, and you're like, huh, there's just a natural chemical release in your mind that says, I took care of it. I figured it out. That's how life can be. I understand problems come. I get it. But friend, you're not helping yourself or anybody else if you're making it bigger and worse than it needs to be. Keep it simple, silly. <laughs> Number three, joy is found in sincerity. That's also there in our text in 2 Corinthians 1.12. Joy is found in sincerity. This kind of holds hands with the first point. Our text tells us to walk in godly sincerity and not in man's wisdom. You and I need to sincerely desire the truth of God's word and desire his will for our lives. Can I encourage you, church, be sincere in your life. Be genuine in your walk. Be real. Be real. 3 John 1, 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Realness, honesty, sincerity. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 and 11, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, 
that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. I've always thought about this about people who pretend to be something they're not. Anyone know someone like that? Yeah? Okay. Anyone sitting next to anyone like that? No, don't, don't raise your hand. It must be exhausting. It must be exhausting trying to get people to think you're better than what you are. I understand the fake it till you make it. You know, you're having a bad day, but you don't want to bring anyone else down. Okay, I get that. I, I do. And I get, you know, trying to, you know, better yourself and build yourself. I get that as well. But man, Jesus dealt with these people called Pharisees a lot. And the Pharisees love to pretend to be better than everyone. They love the preeminence among everybody. But on the inside, they were about as wicked and unrighteous as they come. It's got to be exhausting to have a pharisaical attitude, to try to pretend to have it all together when you don't. I would rather you just be real and say, preacher, I just don't know what I'm doing. And I'll say, hey, that makes two of us. Can I ask you a question? Wouldn't you rather have a pastor who says, you know what, I don't either. Let's figure it out together. Versus someone who says, well, I'll be praying for you, brother. One of these days you shall attain like me. You're probably watching my head grow and thinking, that must, how are you going to get that head out of that building? Right? It must be exhausting trying to pretend like you have it all together. It must be exhausting avoiding a godly sincerity in the eyes of God and everybody else to say, you know what, I'm struggling here and I could use some prayer. Not, again, not, not making it worse than it is, not blowing it up into some huge situation, but simply saying, guys, I could use some prayer. I'm kind of going through a difficult time right now. Not being dramatic about it. Not offloading your burdens on everybody else, but saying, listen, I'm just, I'm really struggling. I can do some prayer. We talked about that in men's prayer breakfast. We talked about that in Sunday school. I know that as a pastor, there's not a lot I can do right. I'm trying. One thing I can do right is simply be real. I've even had people question my realness. Come to the house. You'll, you know, it'll bother you how real I really am in the pulpit. The way, my approach is different, though, and this isn't part of my notes. This is my home church. Like, I, I was saved as a 16-year-old boy in that room. I can't fake a lot of the people who are here. I could try. I could be like, Brother Mike, I have an eight-year degree in theology. And they'd be like, ha! You can't even spell degree, you know? And I'd be like, shh, we have guests. I'm trying to impress them, right? I was in Brother Ryan's Sunday school class. He knows more than he should. I'm just saying, I can't pretend to be something I'm not. Because people here know me. They know the real me. They know that this is what you get. And I'd rather do that than try to pretend like I'm something that I'm not. I'm not saying, just saying, well, I'm just a sinner, so I'm just going to lean into this sin. No, friend, we're saved out of that. Okay? We're not supposed to be carnal. We're not supposed to be worldly. We're supposed to be growing in grace, getting better for Jesus' sake. So when I say be real, I'm not saying, well, just be the sinner that you are. No, we're saved out of that. Right? Jesus said, go and sin no more. He'll forgive you where you're at. He'll save you where you're at. And he'll be there and encourage you. But he said, go and sin no more. As in, you ought to be getting better. Right? You ought to be doing better. Stop relapsing. Stop going back. Keep marching forward for me. Now, I praise God. As we read in Philippians 1, 6, we can be confident that what Jesus started, he will continue till the day of Jesus Christ. Right? He's going to continue till the product is done. He will not leave us or forsake us. However, there ought to be some progress and growth in our walk with Christ. So when I say be real, I'm not saying go all the way back to square one and just enjoy that sin that you were saved out of. I'm saying be real about where you're at. Be real that you haven't got it all figured out yet. Does anyone have it all figured out yet? Just be real that you're a work in progress. Be real that you're still trying to get some victories here and there. Living simply, sincerely, not lying or pretending to be something that you're not. That's how you get joy. Again, we need to be working on ourselves. We need to be growing. But stop trying to fake out yourself and everybody else. Be sincere. Be real. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil spinkings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Friends, you should want to grow sincerely in Christ. 
That should be your desire. Not to go all the way back here. I sincerely want to grow. I'm not there yet. I still need some prayers. I still need some long-suffering and some patience, right? Bear with me as I figure some things out. But when Jesus saves you from that sin nature, there ought to be something inside of you that says, I want to know more about my Lord. I want to be more like Christ. I want to keep walking this way. I want to keep growing the right direction. No, I'm not there yet. And yes, I need prayer. No, I don't have it all figured out. But yes, I truly desire to be more like Christ with my life. Sincerity. I hurt for people who struggle with being real, being sincere. Like I said, I feel like it's just exhausting. Draining trying to surpass everyone's expectations. There's just no room for joy in someone who's living deceitfully, putting on a mask every day, trying to pretend like you have it all together. You got no room for joy like that, friend. Just be real. Be sincere. Be genuine. It's refreshing and it's encouraging to others to know that they're not the only ones struggling. The struggle is real, isn't it? I'm talking about that next Sunday morning, I think. And when we're sincere and real in our faults and shortcomings, we can take those necessary steps to grow. We learn how to pray. We learn how to trust. We learn to rely on Jesus for strength in the areas that we simply cannot suffice. That's how you grow. Be real. Number four, I also see joy is found in the grace of God. Joy is found in the grace of God. I thought that might at least get a holy grunt. I didn't even get an amen, but joy is found in the grace of God. Ephesians 4, 7 says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. The word grace is found over 150 times in Scripture. It means favor, blessing, bounty, benefit, highly favored. There's saving grace. There's living grace. All from the loving hand of our Heavenly Father. According to scriptures, grace and truth came by Jesus. Grace abounds over sin. Grace is given to the lowly and the humble. We stand in the grace of God. We are called by the grace of God. We are justified freely and redeemed by God's grace. The grace of God brings salvation to all men. We can be strong in the grace. We can come boldly and find grace to the very throne of grace. Grace and peace are multiplied to us through the knowledge of God. There's a whole lot more, but I hope I've made my point. The grace of God is something worth shouting about, rejoicing over, and praising God for. And anyone who is saved by grace through faith in Jesus, friend, you have a reason to be joyful. When you start to feel your joy running on E, just think about the grace of God. Think about where you, where you were and where He's brought you to. Think about where you'd be without Him. Think about what your eternity would look like without Him. Think about the grace of God a lot. Philip's ministry in Samaria consisted of Jesus being preached, people responding in faith, and diseases being healed and people getting saved. And Acts 8.8, 8, after all that, says, and there was great joy in that city. Romans 5.20 says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You see, where grace is and abounds, joy is present. David in the Psalms understood that joy is found in the grace of God even in the midst of trials. Even though life is difficult, there's still joy in the grace of God. He says this in Psalm 51, 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Here's the thing about grace, church. None of us deserve it, but God gives it to all of us. What? None of us deserve it. God offers it freely. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Make it a regular habit of yours, church, to reflect on the grace and the blessings of God on your life. <laughs> it's really hard to be disappointed when you think about how good God's been to you. It takes talent to find a way to complain and whine after you spend some time counting your many blessings of God. You will get to a point where you're like, I don't deserve any of that. And yet he still loves me, still blesses me, still gives me grace, still allows me and enables me to do these things. God has spoiled me rotten. How could I not be joyful? That doesn't mean every day is going to be awesome. There'll be some disappointing days. 
but I don't ever have to let it rob me of joy because the grace of God is still much more powerful than any issue I could be facing in this life. Jesus has overcome the world, hasn't he? So there's nothing in the world that can overtake him. And as long as he's still in charge, then I can still have an abounding joy. Last one. Look in verse 12 again back in our text. I'll just go ahead and read it. It says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. Last one I'll give you, and there's more, but this is the last one I'm going to give you today. Joy is found in fellowship of the church. Joy is found in fellowship with the church. Paul understood the importance of his conversation or his testimony to be on display in the world, right? Those are the people who need Jesus. Those are the people who need to be saved. So, of course, I need to showcase Jesus to them. Of course, I need to give the gospel to them. Of course, I need to preach to them. But his joy didn't come when he was in the world. His joy came when he was with you word, the church, the, the like-minded believers, the born-again, blood-bought, saved believers in Jesus. He's like, my joy is full when I'm with y'all. Your spirit and your attitude depend largely upon who you hang around. Did you know that? Your spirit, your attitude depend largely upon who you hang around. And if you're truly after joy, going to look for it out in the sinful world is not going to be very beneficial. I like Chinese food, and, and I like Mexican food. Probably not a good idea to go looking for Mexican food at a Chinese restaurant, though. Would you agree? They might have a quesadilla on the kids' menu, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> if you want Chinese food, go to a Chinese place. Want Mexican food? Go to a Mexican food place. You want pizza? Go to, go to a pizza place. You see what I'm saying? So you might find what you're looking for elsewhere, but it's probably not the real deal and you're probably going to regret having got it. The world can offer you a temporary happiness. The Bible confirms that sin has its pleasure for a season. The world can offer you a temporary zeal, an ecstasy, a relaxation, a feeling of fulfillment and purpose, sure. But by definition, this world can simply not offer you joy. And yet every single day you got Christians who know better but are still looking for joy out there. What are you doing? Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Where else in this world are they biblically commanded to encourage you in love and good deeds? Nowhere. You might have some friends out there, a group that you belong to, and they're good people, that's fine. But you will not find anywhere else in Scripture where they're commanded to, to look out for one another the way the church is commanded to look out for itself, the members. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, how cool is that, that God in His infinite wisdom would put in His perfect word, listen, guys, I want you to encourage one another. I want you to be there for one another. Don't miss out on the assemblings. I want you guys to come together regularly. And when you do, I want you to love each other, encourage them in good works. I want you to uh, pick them up, get them going. I want you to look out for one another. That's pretty amazing. It's sad that we don't do it as often as we should. But it's pretty amazing that in his infinite wisdom, the Lord put that in his word. Now, if you get to being faithful, you get to being involved in your local church, I'm telling you, church, joy follows. I I'm not just all in on getting people involved because I got nothing better to do. I'm telling you, if you take some ownership and you plug yourself into your local church and you start serving it, you start loving it, I'm telling you, joy will follow. Now, guess what? You're going to find the reality that people are people and people always going to people. Okay? Just because you get involved in church does not mean all your problems are over. In fact, I need to be careful. Where there are people, there are problems. Business, church, home, anywhere. Where there are people, there are problems. But when you get yourself plugged in to your local church and you have that heart of, I want to serve Jesus, I want to serve others, I want to contribute, I want to be involved, I'm telling you, church, joy comes. Some of the best 
joyful, fulfilled times of my life has come after a long week of vacation Bible school or some long marathon of teen outreach or something to that degree where I feel wore out and exhausted, right? Perhaps been on the bus all day, had a long teen activity, been at camp all week. You're exhausted, you're sweating, you're wore out, but there is a joy that cannot be bought because there's joy and fellowship in the church. There's joy in getting involved in church. There's joy in being there for your church. You need people and people need you. Joy is found in this truth. And I'm afraid there are people who are saved. Biblically speaking, they are the church. And yet they forsake the assembling. No wonder they feel empty. No wonder they feel like there's something just not quite right, something's just not quite there. You're a part of the body of Christ and you're severed. Of course you don't feel right. Friend, I'm telling you, you've got to get faithful to the fellowship of like-minded believers Your church, oh, it's not perfect by any means, but it's scripturally commanded and emphasized. So I'm looking for joy. I just can't seem to get it. I got to ask you, how faithful are you to your church? How faithful are you to the Lord? How big a deal is all this to you? I feel like something's missing. Yeah, I'm not surprised. You want joy? Get around the right type of people. Quit getting around people who are so negative, who encourage you to do wrong who embellish sin. Get around the right type of people. That's the beauty of fellowship and with God's people. Nobody's perfect, but we're all going the same direction. We all love Jesus. We're all abiding by the same doctrines, at least trying to, right? We're all trying to do right by the Lord. So as we go, we encourage one another. We're all heading the right direction. There's a fellowship there. There's a natural uh, camaraderie. Now, let me give you real quick, just as you can build your pillars of joy, you can also tear them down. These will be really quick because they're basically the exact opposite of the joy pillars. There are pillar killers. First one is guilt, right? Well, we talked about the the sincerity, that clear conscience before the Lord. Guilt is a pillar killer, whether it is from sin or wrongdoing, or maybe it's something Satan's bashing you over the head with, something from your past that you can't help. I'm telling you, guilt will rob you of your joy. You've got to learn how to give that over to the Lord. Confusion is a pillar killer. Confusion will rob you of joy. The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. And where there is a lack of communication, a lack of understanding, a lack of learning, confusion will set in. And church, nobody thrives in confusion. Nobody does. Unfortunately, it kind of comes in life and gets in there and you've got to work to get out of it and work to fix it. I understand that. But nobody thrives in confusion. Confusion will rob you of joy. So this, this simplicity being the joy pillar, then of course overcomplicating things, making it confused, of course that's going to rob you of your joy. Next one, guile. Guile or working in deceit. That will rob you of your joy. Being honest, being open, being true makes plenty of room for real joy rather than working in lies and deception and deceit, trying to keep all these lies up and going, right? I feel like it's like a juggler with too many things in the air when you're just living fake like that. Because it's like, what did I tell them? What did I, how am I living that? What do they think of me, right? What did my Facebook post say today? You know what? And you feel like you're juggling all this stuff. That, That sounds exhausting and awful. Just be real, all right? Don't live in deceit or guile. Another pillar killer is man's expectations. Man's expectations. When we are constantly trying to fulfill what others can unreasonably expect of us, it's going to rob you of your joy. It's going to rob you of your time. It's going to rob you of your energy. Now, we ought to be the best humans we can possibly be. Right? We ought to give it our absolute best. However, you also need to understand, church, you cannot please everybody. If you want to get into the people-pleasing business, do not be a pastor. After every single service, you got half the people who like you and half the people who don't like you, just depending on the sermon, the way of the church, what's going on. can't please everybody. So I guess i got to look somewhere else. Can I say that goes for you too? There are just going to be some people who are upset with you. Scripture tells us, if at all possible, live peaceably with all men, right? Be sincere, be honest, give it your absolute best, but understand, you will never, ever fulfill everybody's expectations, and you're going to hurt yourself and rob yourself of your joy by trying. Live honorably and peacefully and 
sincerely in front of God. The last pillar killer I wrote down is fellowship with the world. I talked quite a bit about that. We're commanded to be separate from the world, and this sinful world will rob you of your joy, eat you up and spit you out, and make you think you're enjoying it too. Remember, sin has its pleasure for a season. You'll think, this is great. Why didn't I do this earlier? You're going to rob yourself of your joy. Fellowship with God's people will encourage you and multiply your joy, but fellowship with the world, that's going to hurt you. I'm going to close now. Statistically speaking, statistically speaking, there is a high percentage likeliness that today you're having some trouble with your joy. Okay? I know I talk about it every year. Statistically speaking, there's a very good chance that most of you, whether you will admit it or not, are struggling in your joy today. I'm not mad at you because it happens, especially this time of year. But the two questions I'll ask you as we close are this. Number one, are you saved? Are you genuinely saved? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? I'm not asking you if you know about Him. Do you know Him? Have you personally confessed your sins and asked Jesus Christ to save your soul and be your personal Savior? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Not the church, not your family, not your grandpa who's a Baptist preacher. I'm talking about you. Are you saved? And next, if you are how much are you making of Jesus in your life? Is he your life? Is he your top priority? Or is he a genie in a bottle for when times get rough? Jesus should be number one. And I talked about that for goodness, I feel like three weeks in a row about real worship. When your worship is off, everything else is off. When Jesus is not at the top, everything else is off. I just... There's just something off. I, I can't explain it. I can't put my finger on it. I'm just sad and I don't know why. I don't know why. I, I don't deserve to be, or I, I shouldn't, you know, I've done nothing to deserve to be sad and nothing's wrong and actually today was pretty good and yet I just, I feel like something's not quite right. How's your walk with Christ? How's your relationship with the one who saved your soul? It's very possible the worship is out of whack and that's why the joy is out of whack. Jesus is the source of joy, so if we have Jesus, we can have joy. But it is also up to us to build upon that foundation. It is up to us to erect these pillars of joy. So if your joy is struggling, is it possible that you're looking for it in the wrong places? I encourage you, church, as we close, turn to Jesus. There is joy in Him. Follow His precepts. There is joy in them as well. Father, would you please help us to be the joyful people we need to be? Lord, we'd be lying to you and ourselves if we told you that we have it all figured out and that joy is easy to come by. Lord, we're struggling. Lord, I'm not saying it's right and I'm not making excuses, but Lord, I truly believe there are folks struggling who want to be joyful, who want to have that positive attitude and energy, who want to be zealous of good works. But Lord, there's just that cloud hovering, that, that, that uh, wh whatever it is, that sadness or that anger, that bitterness, whatever it may be. Lord Jesus, we are asking you to help us get victory over these doldrums, victory over this discouragement. Lord, please help us to turn our eyes to you. Help us to be joyful in you. Lord, help us to seek you, to seek to please you in everything we do. Lord, please help us with our joy. We are needy people. We cannot do it alone. We ask you to deal with us individually and corporately during this invitation time. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able to, please stand with me. I don't want anybody looking around or talking, playing on your phone. That can come later. For now, as Miss Donna plays a verse of invitation, the altar's open. If you would like to come forward and pray, I encourage that. I simply want to inquire at your joy, and I want to inquire at what your focus has been on lately. It is very possible if your focus has not been right, your joy has not been right. Friends, Jesus has not turned his back on you. He hasn't given up on you. He's not done with you. He's waiting for you to turn your eyes back to him, to give those burdens over to him, to understand that he is the source of joy. Pattern your life after Jesus and the things that he emphasizes. He emphasizes the church. He emphasizes his word. He emphasizes being others-minded and loving others. Friend, you pattern your life after what Jesus tells you to do. I promise you, joy is going to fall in place. 
doesn't mean every day is going to go exactly how you wanted it. doesn't mean every day you're just going to be happy, click your heels and skipping. But it does mean there will be a deep abiding joy through every season of life. You cannot put a price on that. Turn your eyes to Christ. Obey his prompting. Whatever your need, do business with the Lord. will look up here from the bottom of my heart thank you for being here church i trust it was a blessing and thought provoking i want to remind you we have choir practice at 4 30 today if you have any questions you can see brother ryan leak about that I want to remind you of our church service at 6 p.m we're going to be closing the jonah series tonight at 6 p.m and if you have been here the last few sunday nights you know that it's it's getting pretty deep uh, in regards to jonah's attitude and how he handled God's working and so it's it's a little bit in your face and tonight will be the same so I'm just warning you but I believe we need to be confronted with those truths we need to be warned of the danger of choosing to pout rather than to shout every one of you right now could choose to either complain or rejoice about whatever you wanted to right it's a choice and so Jonah what we're seeing is the repercussions of choosing to whine about the circumstances rather than praise God for it so it's something we all need to be warned about. I hope you'll be here tonight. Choir practice, 430, church at 6. We'll close in a word of prayer, and then we'll go our separate ways. I'm going to ask Brother Jim Adams to lift his voice and close us in prayer. And when Brother Adams is done praying, we are dismissed. Thank you all so much for coming. Brother Adams, go ahead.